Okay, well, let's dive in. Um, my name is Steve Haynes. Um, I'm super interested in bodies and how bodies work. And I've really learned that mental health is dependent on how we feel. And a large part of this lecture is really exploring the feeling business. By being good at feeling, we don't just change pain, but we also change emotional states. And that's quite radical, I think, in our culture. Psychology is seen as a different territory from, um, from the body. So if you get diagnosed with anxiety disorders, you'll be sent to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, typically in the mental health system, and be asked to take medications or probably counselling as a way of supporting I think good medications and good counselling, good talking treatments are excellent ways of working with anxiety. Please don't get me wrong, throughout the whole of this lecture, we just want to explore the idea of embodiment and working with our physiology as a way of changing anxiety. I used to work in mental health, so I was a failed engineer. Uh, I tried to work in the city in London for many years. Uh, well, not many years, a year actually. Uh, that was hard work, didn't suit me at all. And then I started volunteering with people with learning difficulties and people with mental health problems. And then I changed career at 24 to work with entirely with people with mental health problems. I used to work for an organization called Mind, Mind in Camden, Mind in Islington. I really learned a lot uh, at that time. And I really learned a lot about difference and about inclusivity and about power and how that really affects people. Um, and I was an advocate at some stage, so I was campaigning for people with mental health problems, including anxiety, to get services from doctors. Um, but at about that time, I got into yoga, and I was completely fascinated by the idea that you could change your mood by breathing, or you could change your mood by stretching, or being more present to your body. And that fascination has continued with me um, now in my 50s. Um, and I'm incredibly passionate about achieving change in what's typically seen as mental health problems, such as trauma and anxiety, by connecting to our body. So to explain why that is true, we need to go to some basic principles. So the structure of this talk is what is anxiety? Uh, what is an emotion? So understand anxiety uh, we need to understand and have a sophisticated notion of what an emotion is. And then we'll look at some principles to help us change anxiety, mostly rooted in embodiment. I'll be pausing every so often during this talk. So uh, the main first part is due to take about an hour. Uh, I'll pause about 50 minutes and mostly do Q&A through the chat. And I'll check the chat every so often. So if there's things that aren't making sense, please just put some information in the chat and I'll try and collect that and I'll pause every so often. Uh, the last half hour of the talk is me talking about uh, cranial sacral therapy. So uh, the logic for me of helping people connect to their bodies, for me, I think using touch to help people to connect to the bodies is my preferred route of doing that. So the last half hour, I teach two year courses in cranial sacral therapy. So using the principles I'm going to outline here around anxiety, I'm going to offer a, a way of working that involves touch and try and make a case why touch can support people, particularly to feel safer and come out of anxiety states. Uh, this is me, uh, kind of. I've written four comic books now. The first one was Pain is Really Strange, then Trauma is Really Strange. I'm going to be talking about trauma next month. Uh, and then the latest one is Touch is Really Strange. Uh, the anxiety one about two, three years ago um, was highly commended by the British Medical Association. So that was thrilling for me and Sophie. Uh, Sophie has been a big part of the books, the artist. So yeah, the ideas, a lot of the ideas we're going to cover in this talk are covered in more detail with references is in anxiety is really strange. Let's see. So is there a problem of anxiety? Do we need to worry about this? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. So 
the most common type of psychiatric disorder in the United States. The lifetime prevalence of anxiety disorders among American adults is 28%. That's more than one in four people who are seriously affected by anxiety. That's a huge, huge amount of anxiety. And uh, for children, uh, teenagers, it's getting worse. Um, uh, this is, I mean, it's old data now, 2007, 2012. These were big studies. I remember when they came out at the time because they caused quite a ripple, the idea that one in three adolescents will experience anxiety disorder. And these statistics are getting worse. So since 2012, uh, here's one from the New York Times a couple of days ago, actually, April 23rd. The US Surgeon General warned of a devastating mental health crisis around adolescents. I thought long and hard about the word epidemic in the title or description of this uh, workshop or um, lecture series. But yeah, uh, an epidemic of anxiety, a devastating experience of an, an crisis among adolescents. This is the US Surgeon General. So we don't really understand uh, why this is happening to such a degree. There are theories and models, but uh, these important trends in anxiety, depression and suicide that stop us in our tracks. This is the researchers talking about uh, just being overwhelmed by this rise in peaking in anxiety. Here's one indication of this. This is people going to the emergency room visits for self-inflicted injuries in America. And you can see over the last decade, it's more than double. So from 2009 to 2019, uh, I'm more than doubling of emergency room visits for self-inflicted injuries for uh, young women, this is adolescents. And uh, folks, this is not gonna be any better in lockdown and the current sort of crisis that we've been through in the world and all the ongoing mental health challenges. So yeah, a huge, huge rise in anxiety in adolescents and uh, one in four people experiencing chronic anxiety. Um, that's a lot of anxiety. So the first section of the talk, what is anxiety? I'm initially going to start with really a kind of a challenging idea because the dominant idea is so strong that anxiety is a mental emotional problem. I'm going to come from a very different perspective. I'm a body worker and I privilege models that uh, explore physiology and the body. Uh, this is a woman called Ida Rolf. Ida Rolf drew a line in the sand around bodies and psychology. And this is a little bit provocative, but to get people thinking. So Ida Rolf, uh, she developed something called Rolfing, which was uh, in the 1920s onwards. Um, and it became, you might have heard of Rolfing. Uh, she was famous for working with fascia and going quite deep to try and release fascia was her explanatory model at the time. Not too worried about releasing fascia as a model, but here's what Ida Rolf says. This is a famous quote from the 1970s. There is no such thing as psychology. There is only physiology. Now, this is a hardcore body worker's view that by changing the physiology, uh, we change how we think, how we feel. All thinking, all feeling, all emotions is actually rooted in physiological states. So this was part of the movement where we have body armoring or we're contracted and we've lost the ability to regulate our body. We have all sorts of tensions and the tensions are things that cause us to think and feel differently. We're going to lean into that and explore that a little more. But yeah, this phrase, there is no such thing as psychology, there is only physiology. Let's say this is one end point, one extreme of the model that bodies are part of the process of anxiety. It's much more than just psychology. Here's a more modern version of this. This is someone called Stephen Porges. Stephen Porges developed a theory called polyvagal theory that looks as the physiology of safety and he made some models, a theory, polyvagal theory, about how we respond to danger. Porges offers that human beings need safety. That's an important theme of this lecture. The most 
basic decision you're making as a human being is, am I safe or not? And if we are perceive the danger, then our biology goes crazy. Our biology goes to all sorts of threat responses, defense cascades, things like fight or flight, you might have heard of, or freeze. We speed up to survive or we collapse to survive. Stephen Porges opposite that these biological changes are the underlying root of our psychology. So biology, not psychology. Let's read a little bit more. So for Porges, we interface according to our physiological state. If our nervous system needs interactions with other people, that's how we co-regulate, that's how we look after ourselves. So being social is really, really important for Porges. We are social animals and we need safety in those social situations. If we're in a safe social situation, we can co-regulate. So being around self people helps us to better regulate our physiological state to optimize health, growth and restoration. When we are regulated, our mental processes are simultaneously enhanced, our thoughts can be bolder and more expansive and creative and perhaps even spiritual. These emergent features associated with safety and being regulated with other people are not going to be expressed if we're in a state of constant threat. So we can't regulate ourselves, we can't relate to other people if we are in a threat detection mode. Every system in our body is subsumed to the perception of threat. A lack of safety causes anxiety uh, and many other things, but anxiety is a big part of what happens when we feel unsafe. So why is this important? Because the dominant model is anxiety is a psychological problem. I'm using some researchers to say that it's a physiological problem as much as a pure psychological problem. Here's some research that helps us understand this or a quote. This is a paper, uh, 2015, the neuronal circuits for fear and anxiety. So what's the difference between fear and anxiety? That's a difficult question. Typically, fear would have been seen about shaking bodies and contracting, moving away, would have been gestures in the body. And anxiety would have been seen what your mind would have been doing, the psychology in response to something that was threatening. What this research is saying, what I'm offering is, we can't really separate out body typically fear responses as they're described and anxiety, typically mental emotional responses. And this research says that if you frame people as in fear or you frame people as being anxious, the brain and neuromodulatory or the hormones or the chemicals uh, do the same thing. They exhibit great overlap. So fear and anxiety are the same thing. Let's keep leaning into that. This is another study in The Lancet. The Lancet is a really, really important medical journal, 2021. Anxiety disorders involve dysfunction in brain circuits that respond to danger. So anxiety emerges when we perceive threat. This isn't just a mental emotional response, changes everything in our body. We're complex. We have a nervous system, an immune system, an endocrine system. These are all systems in the body that are working to regulate us. Here's a quote. Because the nervous, endocrine, and immune systems have constant reciprocal communication, they tend to react to a stressor in a highly orchestrated manner as a single unit. So if there's threat or the perception of danger that will be perceived largely by the nervous system and our senses or our thoughts or our histories. But if we perceive threat, every system in our body has to adapt and change. We have stress hormones. You might have heard of adrenaline and cortisol. We have nervous system reflexes of contracting, speeding up, going really, really quick. And we have a whole chaos in our immune system. So every system in the body has to change if we perceive threat. So 
I hope this helps us understand that it's much more than psychology, that when we perceive threats, every system in our body, these regulatory systems of endocrine, immune and nervous system change, our heart rate changes, our gut changes, our muscle tone changes, all sorts of things are working really, really hard to protect us. Let's look at someone who's uh, a hero, uh, a sense of threat. Right now, this is a baby hanging from a balcony. Here's our hero. Let's see what happens. So this is a man who's responding to an altruistic sense of danger. Someone else is in danger, but he's mobilizing, speeding up and doing some incredible feats to help him, to help the baby hanging from the balcony. So I want you to think about all the things going on in his body to help him to respond to the threat. Do this incredible act of heroism. Yay, there we go, saves the baby. So lots and lots of things are going on there, aren't they? Every system in his body has changed. He's thinking differently. His focus has gone from being really, really wide and uh, relaxed, wondering about what he's gonna have for dinner, maybe, I don't know. He's walking along the street and he sees this potentially dangerous situation. So his horizon goes from creative, expansive thinking to narrow, focused, I've got to do this and I've got to do it now. So when we're in a stress state, our thinking gets very, very linear. So that's important to understand. We can't, haven't got the time to do nuance. We haven't got the time to uh, think about other people and take in a range of options. It's like, this is life or death. I have to do it and I have to do it now. His heartbeat will be going really, really fast. His breathing will be going really fast. He needs to suck in lots of oxygen. He needs to uh, get that oxygen into his blood. He needs to pump that blood to his bigger muscles, to his brain, his liver, his heart, his lungs, so he can move really, really quickly. So his heart's up, his breathing up, his muscle tone is up. Some long-term projects are gonna be switched off. His digestion will be poorly controlled. His immune system will be poorly controlled. It'll, some things will be working really fast in your immune system. You get more inflammation initially. And long-term projects such as growth and repair, nourishing uh, reproductive hormones, um, growing hair, all those sorts of things. All of that is also going to be switched off. So something's super, super quick. His senses narrowed, focused, focused on what he has to do. His thinking quite linear, not flexible at all. And lots of long-term projects are switched off. So complete chaos in his body, really. The parallel psychological states that emerge when we get stuck in a stress response, we tend to stay stuck in the linear thinking. We tend to be, have a bracing heartbeat. Those things, that man peaked. Our hero did really well. After he'd rescued the baby, he went into a room and he actually did some shaking to discharge all of that. And he got lionized. He had a successful response. He was able to achieve his goal. And that's normally very helpful for people. They do a stress and they're able to rest. They've achieved something and they can come out of their stress state. But for many of us, we go into a stress state and we stay there. And there's this sort of incredible overactive physiological responses are running us in the background. And they have huge consequences for how we think and how we feel. Anxiety is led, I'm offering, by being stuck in a threat response, by being stuck in a gesture of fight or flight. Good, let me just check the chat and just see if this is all making sense. Here's Cary Grant from North by Northwest running away from an airplane that's attacking him. So he's in mobilizing mode. He's going quick to survive, sometimes called fight or flight. The main chemicals on that are adrenaline, a go quick hormone. Adrenaline for a few minutes, then cortisol, pretty similar to adrenaline, takes over. We can secrete cortisol 
for most of our lives actually has huge detrimental consequences for many, many systems from thinking to blood vessels to digestion. Cortil, elevated cortisol is bad news generally. But mobilizing, speeding up to survive, we have narrow focus, fixed thinking, we're going very, very quick. We switch off our digestion, so we often have signs of a drowned mouth. Breathing up, heart rate up, we're diverting blood to the big muscles, we're taking in lots of oxygen. Uh, we divert blood away from hands and feet, so hands and feet get very, very cold here. We have stereotypical imprecise action patterns with lots of heightened tension. So we run, jump, fight, shut down. These action patterns aren't sophisticated, they're simple. We switch off our digestion and long-term projects, libido, immune system, growth, growth and repair are all switched off. So to be stuck in this mobilizing state causes havoc in our body. And I'm offering that all human beings, if you put them under pressure, we will either speed up to survive, we mobilize, or we immobilize, we shut down to survive. I'm gonna talk much more about immobilizing in the trauma is really strange um, webinar. We're gonna focus particularly on mobilizing as surviving because in that gesture of going quick, the psychological correlate goes from an easy, to anxiety, to panic, very, very commonly. My heart is beating, my gut is churning, my mouth is dry. I call that collection of symptoms anxiety. This becomes a habit in the body, becomes a background automatic way of responding to the world. In fact, it gets so bad that we can't differentiate anxiety from excitement. Anything that causes my heart rate to go up, I've only learned to interpret that as a bad thing. So my heart's racing, it's too much for me. And instead of allowing or exploring, could this be excitement? I use a simple shorthand. I, give, I use the way of describing it that has worked for me in the past. And I often call that anxiety. So why do people do that? Why do we substitute simple default descriptions for very, very complex physiology? So here's a subtle argument, and I hope I can, I hope this bit makes sense. So one reason, please remember, I am arguing for some innate responses. I'm arguing that we speed up to survive or we um, shut down to survive. I think all mammals, even very, very primitive animals will exhibit this very, very primitive response. So let's look at a single cellular organism showing us its behavior. This is a amoeba or a single cellular organism, I don't know the official name, it has no nervous system but it's exhibiting behavior of moving towards, seeking, exploring, and it will exhibit behaviors. It will move towards things it likes, and it will move away from things it dislikes. I'm going to say the contraction moving away is the root of fear. There's things I don't like, I move away from them. I think that's innate to life. And we see this in an organism without a nervous system. The opposite of contraction and fear is creativity, novelty, exploration. And one of the main theorists around emotion, uh, Jack Pansep calls this basic drive of seeking. We move towards things we like, we move away from things we don't like. He thought that this was a primal emotion or a primal drive in human beings. And this is deeply rooted in our physiology. We move towards things we like, we move away from things we don't like. He's famous, Jack Pansep, for tickling rats. He discovered that you can tickle a rat and the rat will follow the hand around. It seeks pleasure and the rats will move away from the touch that they don't like. 
So he recorded rats can laugh, but you, they laugh at a high, fre high, high frequency. He discovered this by random, uh, accidentally, and he can record the rats laughing and seeking and moving towards touch that they like. Fantastic. So I do teach, I do believe that seeking or avoidance are fundamental goals of uh, organisms and that partly this is encoded in the brain. And I also teach that uh, we have fight or flight or freeze. For human beings, we speed up to survive or we collapse or run away. And then I stop. Those are the innate responses. Everything else is really, really complex. And this is important because in the complexity, we can find freedom. Because the problem becomes when we start thinking that emotions are fixed. I think emotions are flexible, creative, complex responses of human beings to try and make sense of the underlying physiology in our body. So emotions are complex constructs. They are not fixed, hardwired things. You are not an anxious person. You weren't born anxious. You weren't uh, innately anxious. It's not an essential feature of you. It's a protective response rooted in speeding up to survive is what I'd like to offer. But we have some struggles here because there are some models of emotion that say that emotions are fixed things. This partly goes back to Darwin. Darwin argued, this is not the argument I'm making, I just want to show you or illustrate the hardwired essential argument. Darwin argued that emotional expressions are not just universal across cultures, but have their roots in purposeful and similar animal behaviors across many mammalian species. A chimpanzee uses similar muscle groups to purse its lips as we do, and often for the same reasons. We are not as different or as special as we might suppose. So if we can recognize an emotion in a chimpanzee, this is an indicator for Darwin and other theorists that this is a universal cross-species thing. Emotions are in animals, emotions are therefore essential fixed things. And it's very easy to see why. Is this a happy dog or a sad dog? Well, I'd say it's a sad dog. Those eyes, the posture, the collapse thing. I very much think that this dog is in a state of withdrawal. However, I want us to be careful of projecting a human emotion onto the dog. We don't actually know what the dog feels because we can't ask the dog. I think emotions are complex. And I'd almost reserve the notion that emotions are part of language and part of culture. But, you know, Darwin and uh, this sort of response to animals often makes us feel that we do have fixed emotions. But there's a real problem with this, because if we think we have fixed emotions, we end up saying things like, I'm anxious, or I'm an angry person, and it feels a big, heavy, fixed thing that we have no choice about. The model I'm going to offer is that if we experience emotions as com complex responses, to the innate response of speeding up to survive or collapsing to survive, then we have much more room for maneuver. Here's some famous research that's in the hardwired camp. So this was done by Paul Ekman in the 1960s. He came up with six universal basic emotions emotions you can see in animals and emotions that are cross-cultural. Every human being, regardless of their race, their faith, their geography, will understand these emotions is the contention of Paul Ekman. Now, these pictures are of actors, actually. They're actually fake emotions. But Ekman, 
showed these pictures to people in America and famously he traveled to Papua New Guinea and showed them to tribes people in Papua New Guinea. And his research or his conclusion was that the people in Papua New Guinea would recognize the same innate emotions. And this was very, very powerful, particularly when you're tied in with Darwin and particularly when you're tied in with looking at animals, we can see that animals are experiencing withdrawal or an avoidance, and we often project our experience onto the animal. Unfortunately, I think this model is wrong. It's an essentialist model. There are many, many ways of expressing emotions. Let's look at a little bit more of the essentialist model. Uh, bioenergetics uses the essentialist way of working. We have body types and body characters. So it's not just your facial muscles that have universal signatures or universal gestures. Our bodies are seen as having universal characters. So this essentialist model is that there are innate emotions, innate qualities inside of people, and we can discern them. Unfortunately, however, the research hasn't been validated. And I think this is a very, very bad model because it limits our flexibility. People take this really quite far. You have types of people. Louise Hay is quite a famous book. Uh, you can heal your life. Louise Hay says that we have essentialist qualities in different parts of our body. So, for example, mid back pain is all about guilt and uh, the notion of being stuck. Uh, get off my back. I don't really understand it if I'm if I if I'm honest. Lower back pain is about fear of money or lack of financial support. This book sold over 35 million copies and is all about these prescriptive innate qualities that you can, that there's a signature in your body that's universal and cross-cultural. All human beings express anger in the same way. They express guilt in the same way. And if our bodies hold all sorts of patterns, and if you're clever, you can discern those universal patterns. It's a hard argument to argue against, but it's the wrong argument, I'm afraid. Um, why do I say that? Well, we're going to offer a model called constructed emotion. And uh, this model is developed by someone called Lisa Feldman Barrett. And I think it's really beautiful and gives us far more choice and hope around something like anxiety. It helps us move away from an, saying that we are a fixed anxious person into realizing that we have choice and agency and we can learn to feel different things. I have feelings inside of me that I have historically interpreted as anxiety, but they could be something else. Now that's a mouthful. You can begin to see why we use I'm just anxious and I kind of give up because the world of feeling is hard, it's messy and difficult. But Feldman Barra offers that we can learn to interpret our feelings differently. We can learn not to call, we can have a beating heartbeat, a churning gut, but sometimes we can call that excitement rather than anxiety. I'm gonna show you something that's a mess right now. This is probably just a blob of black and white for all of you. For most human beings, particularly when we're young, we don't know what we feel. It's hard to make sense of all the information inside of us. We learn about what we feel through experience, and we often learn from our parents and our culture. If we get told that we're anxious, if we get told that we're angry, if we get told that we're bad, if we get, if we learn how you do it, I grew up in Warwickshire, I learned the Warwickshire version of happiness. And that had all sorts of particular meanings and connotations for me. So this is a mess of information. 
I'm going to make sense of this information for you, and it will forever be different for you. Please keep breathing when you look at the next slide. The mess is now going to be associated with a prediction. I hope you can see the snake here. There's the head of the snake, the eyes of the snake, and the curling snake. If we go back to the picture, now you can probably see the snake has emerged. We now have an interpretive framework for the mess of information. Here's the snake. Here's the snake. Hopefully you can see that pattern emerging. You've now learned something. Your brain has taken a mess of information and has shaped it into a coherent pattern. You will now predict different things when you look at a mess of information now, a mess of black and white. Why do we do that? Well, you might be able to see the snake in this mass of leaves. It's very, very adaptive to be able to pick out salient or important information and making up a meaningful story. The human beings who could spot the snake in this picture and could predict it would survived more. They would learn to avoid the dangerous places and they might code black and white or uneven patterns. They might be more cautious stepping into the leaves. They might be more anxious. There was information that was salient, that was important, and they needed to assess to create safety. So human beings, all human beings, as we learn, all the mess of feelings, all the surges of chemicals, all the heart beating, all the churning guts, all the muscle tensions, we learn to group those sensations and we begin to call them what our parents called them, what our peers called them, what our culture calls them. We call them anxiety, anger, happiness, joy, love. We have to learn how to feel those things. They are not innate. One of the strongest arguments against innate feelings is that we can express happiness in many, many ways. My football team scores, yes, I'm super happy. I'm angry and I'm clenching my fist. Clenching a fist can be a gesture of happiness, yes, my team has scored, or it can be a gesture of anger. Uh, it's an ingredient that can form uh, as part of the recipe for many different emotions. A beating heartbeat, a surge of adrenaline, a churning gut, that package, depending on the amounts, those ingredients, we could make up a story, we could bake a cake that's about excitement. We can use those ingredients, we can come up with a different recipe depending on our learning and our history. Some people might take X amount of heartbeat, X amount of adrenaline, X amount of churning gut, and they might make excitement. And they might add a little bit of moving their eyebrows at that stage. That package is unique to that person, that culture. It's not universal. We have so many ways of expressing happiness. We have so many ways of expressing anxiety. Absolutely, the category of anxiety exists, but there's no universal signature. There's no brain pattern that's universal to human beings. There's no set of gestures that are always the same across all cultures for everybody who's happy. We do it in different ways at different times. It's complex. We do what we've learned to do, what we've been given by our parents, given by our experience, what we've been given by our culture. Emotions are complex. They are not innate, simple, hardwired things. Good, I hope that's beginning to make sense. Let me see if there's any questions or um, particular themes emerging. So people got the snake bit. I hope that wasn't too distressing for you. So the, a grin can be an embarrassment for Eastern people. Fantastic. Yeah, we have 
lots and lots eye contact can be threatening or normal in different contexts standing close to people standing far away from people different interpretations in different places good i don't think the snake was moving its tongue in and out but um uh, uh no it's not a, not a visual illusion in that one in that sense Good, so Darwin argued that emotions are hardwired and that they're innate. There's some, I will argue that we have innate responses of speeding up to survive or collapsing, shutting down to survive and that we seek, we move towards things or we avoid things we don't like. But how we do that is dependent on our culture and our learning. We don't have innate emotions there are common categories. Anger exists, of course it exists. Anxiety exists, of course it exists. But how you do anxiety depends on all sorts of things. And we do ourselves a disservice when we can only use simple words to describe complex states. Let's look again at Feldman Barrett, because now we're beginning to get into the territory of how we can change our anxiety. We can change our response to our physiology if we understand that our physiology isn't fixed. Here's Lisa Feldman Barrett. He's an angry person. I'm a very anxious person. We've all made statements like these. These point towards the belief that emotions are hardwired in our brains and automatically triggered by events. I am offering that this isn't true following the theorist Lisa Feldman Barrett. She thinks we construct emotions. We use predictions, histories, learning from the past to interpret the whole um, mess, the whole complex activities in our bodies. It's so complex that we tend to use shorthand defaults. Here's what often happens. If we're not skillful at feeling, we tend to use limited words to describe our feeling states. If you only have two ways of describing your feeling states, I'm feeling awesome and I'm feeling crappy, you basically only have two emotions. You use very broad brush strokes to describe complex things. This isn't seen as emotionally intelligent. If you could distinguish finer meanings within awesome, I'm happy, content, thrilled, relaxed, joyful, hopeful, inspired, prideful, adoring, grateful, blissful, and you can have 50 shades of awesome and 50 shades of crappy, I'm angry, aggravated, alarmed, spiteful and the whole list there, then you have far more options for predicting, categorizing and perceiving emotions. You have more flexible and useful responses. So we go from this state that I'm an anxious person and it's fixed. Even Darwin says that we're a victim to our emotions and there's basically nothing we can do about them. We've got a primitive, horrible, um, protective reflexes that are out of our control, we go to this state that we can describe them differently, feel them differently, explore them differently. We have more flexible, useful responses. I think this is incredibly powerful and a really beautiful way of working. How do you know that you're anxious? That's often because you've been told that in the past. It's often it's a habit that's emerged to describe complex states because it's too much, it's too difficult, it's too hard to feel. If we can learn to feel more, if we can learn to differentiate our feelings and often sometimes get practice at that, we can learn to be less anxious. Feeling is important. Here's a theorist on feeling and emotion. Many of us aren't very good at feeling and this causes problems. Some of the most devastating medical and public health problems of our, of our time, depression, substance addiction, and intractable pain are centered on pathologies of feeling. I would absolutely add anxiety into that list. 
If we don't feel very well, we do the worst case scenario. We do what we've always done. We do what we've been told we are. We do the anxious. This thing I'm feeling, this little surge of adrenaline, that tightening in my back, that must be anxiety because that's the only way I know to explain that. That's hard, folks. No doubt about it. If we can find support, if we can find new ways of describing that, if we can accept that emotions aren't hardwired and they're open to interpretation, we can start to negotiate the feeling business. No one's saying this is easy, but it is possible. This is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a concentration camp survivor, and he wrote beautifully about man and his search for meaning. A uh, very famous author, if you read about happiness, you'll always see Viktor Fro Frankl quoted. Happiness is meaning, actually. So here's a quote. This is attributed to Frankl. It's actually an interpretation of his writing, but it's uh, very true to the spirit of his writing. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So something's happening to me. I'm perceiving threat or danger. That might be very, very habitual. I don't even know that I feel unsafe. I'm just in the habit of protecting myself. I'm doing what I've always done because I'm an anxious person and I need to be careful. I need to not have too much stimulus. But there is a stimulus and I have an emerging response. I could do what I've always done. I could contract, I could move, I could get lost in my quick heartbeat. Or we can realize that we have the ability to negotiate at that point. Now, this takes practice. It's not hard. It's not easy. It's very hard, in fact. But it is possible to create a space because we are not hardwired. We do have agency. We do have choice. We can reconstruct even our most fixed, basic, most horrible drives and recreate them. How do I know this is really anxiety? And often we need space to do that. Often we need a lot of safety. Often we need to feel relaxed and easy in our body. But if we can find those spaces, we can learn to choose. And in our choosing, we have growth and freedom. So I'm a huge fan of anything that allows us to be different and of playing and knowing what we feel. So feeling is important, and feeling is a beautiful word in English. We have feeling as sensations. Now, sensations can be hot, cold, tight, soft. I'm contracted, I'm open, it's warm, it's, it's, um, it's tingling. Being skillful at meeting your body at the level of feeling as sensations and learning to soften, breathe differently, practice being with intense sensations helps us not get lost in feelings as emotions. So the word double meaning of the word feeling in English is that feeling can not only be sensations, hot, cold, tight, soft, it can be feelings as love and joy and anxiety and anger. I'm so unskilled at feeling, and it's so scary, I just use my default broad brush stroke. And whenever I feel anything that's going quick, I'm always anxious, and I never take the time, or I don't have the support or the safety to discover whether this really is anxiety, or whether it could be hunger or whether it could be a little bit of excitement, or whether it could be the type of anxiety that is anticipation. And that if I notice it and realize, well, I've got some choices here, and I, it's anticipated I've done something like this before, and I might be okay, then we've got granulation and nuance. Then we've got a new prediction. We're learning a new possibility. Uh, we're not doing what we always do, we have a chance to grow and be free. So there's a huge value in appreciating our raw feeling states. 
I'm just going to finish with a couple of technical terms about these raw feeling states. So affect is a word, it's a sciencey technical word, but it describes feelings as sensations, all the competing speeds and chemicals and twitches and tingles, this background tone of your body, a technical word for that is affect. Affect is basically made up of two things. It's pleasant or unpleasant, and I'm agitated or calm. All emotions are a complex mental construct trying to make up a story to make sense of affect. Here's a graph of affect. So we have these two qualities, valence, I like it, or I dislike it. It's positive valence or negative valence. And it either makes me agitated, I'm highly aroused, or it makes me calm, I have low arousal. And here's a nice attempt, 2018, nice paper to say that delighted is a mix of liking something and being highly aroused. Angry, anxious would be, I don't like it, and I'm highly aroused. They haven't got anxiety on this, but it would be in this sort of place. It's, I'm very, very agitated and I really don't like it. We might call that anxiety. We'd be in this zone. Being bored is I don't like it, but I've got low, um, low arousal state. So this is a really, really elegant model. All emotions are complex predictions that emerge as your physiology shifts. Your physiology is these raw feeling states, this technical word of affect. I like it, I dislike it. I move towards it, I move away from it. And it's important. I need to do it quickly with lots of energy. I'm highly aroused or it's not that important. I haven't got much energy. I'm sort of collapsed around it. That's your basic state. If you get good at those raw physiology states, you get good at trying to work out what you're feeling and you get good at finding new words, new, um, new ways of describing, how do I really know that I'm anxious? How do I know that I'm not hungry and I'm not anticipating? How do I know that I'm mildly excited rather than desperately um, anxious because these are ingredients speed is an ingredient beating heartbeat a churning gut a little bit of cortisol you can bake a new recipe you can make up new stories with the same ingredients and I think that's an enormously powerful thing to offer to yourself feeling is important feeling is hard Feeling anxious is horrible when you're stuck in worry states and repetitive thoughts. We can break that cycle by getting support to feel safe, by being around people who love us and support us and help us find a sense of safety. We can co-regulate in order to self-regulate. We can find therapists and body workers and yoga teachers. We can walk with people, we can do things with people, and we can learn that we can calm and discharge our overactive physiology. And we can learn to be with intense feeling states and realize that they are protective feelings. I'm speeding up to survive, but I don't always have to be call that anxiety or anger. I can call it a protective feeling that's trying to look after me but is working a bit too hard I don't like it very much but I don't have to call myself anxious at this moment good well I hope that's useful for you um, the model of this is this sort of sense of reframing and learning to interpret things differently here's a panel from my book let's just finish with this panel Reframing is a tried and tested technique for changing anxiety used by psychologists, mindful practitioners, body workers. It fits beautifully with Elizabeth Feldman Barrett's constructed emotion model. How do you know that what you feel is anxiety? Note the nuances and details of the sensations inside you. Where do I feel that in my body? 
not why do I feel anxious, really focus on the location, the shape, the nature of the sensations, not why do I feel it, how do I feel it, where do I feel it, give it a, a place in your body. Keep noticing, go slow, cultivate the gap between physiological shifts and co-emerging thoughts, emotions, and memories. In the gap, see if you can reframe fear to excitement. Instead of saying, I'm anxious, try, there is something like anxiety inside me. It's a much richer statement. It feels really clunky when you try it but it is possible to meet this incoherent, unexplainable, horrible world of sensations and practice to interpret them differently, not always do the worst possible interpretation and not get stuck telling yourself that you're an anxious person when there's so many other ways that you can learn to respond to what's happening inside of you. Good. Uh, I hope that was useful. That's the end of the talk around anxiety. I'm going to just go through a little bit of Q&A and answer some questions. So uh, just give me a bit of feedback about what you notice and what worked in that. I'm hoping some of the themes of bodies, uh, being able to choose, not being hardwired emotions, hardwired to go quick, hardwired to collapse hardwired to seek and avoid, but not complex emotions. They aren't hardwired. We're not innately anxious, innately angry, innately happy. We learn those things. How to feel safe in our body when we have chronic illnesses and the body is the main source of anxiety. Yeah, bodies often feel alien and we feel our body's broken and it's painful. So when we learn to feel, one thing that often happens is this incredible sensitivity or incredible pain that we meet in our bodies. And that's hard, there's no two ways about it. If something's been done to our body or we feel that our body is broken or wrong or ill, that's really hard, really, really hard. But I would offer that we can always find safety and joy. Being embodied is not a choice. You're in the world, you have a body, it's very hard to construct yourself as being uh, other than or outside of a body. It's not very efficient or predictive of good health. So my hope is that we can always find something that's safe enough to start with. And you might need a lot of support to start finding qualities of joy and ease and to start constructing your body as not a broken machine, but as something that's adaptable, flexible. It might be a challenge to do that, but that challenge mindset and that ability to find hints and memories of joy and ease is the start to realizing you're not a broken machine, but there is the possibility of adaptation and new feelings inside of you, even in the most chronic uh, places where we feel our body has really let us down and we feel our body is really alien. Um, I hope to speak at such a big subject, but yeah, uh, hopefully. Meditation, breath, and yoga work for the body. Absolutely. So I, one of my big early challenges around embodiment was our yoga teacher said to me, if you've got a space under your armpits, then you can't be sad. If you've got a space under your armpits, your chest is lifted, you're breathing more efficiently, and it's very hard to be sad if you've got clear oxygen exchange. So often many of us are breathing... <laughs> We have altered blood chemistry in those stress responses. Those altered blood chemistry doesn't make control our muscles very well and speeds up, causes inflammatory states. And the poor oxygen control and the tight breath pattern, you become your physiology. You become anxious and inflamed and upset and depressed, led by the stress pattern in your breath. So it becomes a downward circle. So absolutely huge fan of yoga, meditative processes. That's nice, Joe. Great to reframe our anxiety feeling, to recognize and to know that often this fizz inside me is team me supporting me. What a lovely phrase. Thank you for that, Joe. It's hard to interpret feelings. Yes, but feelings are the territory of consciousness. Uh, there's no such thing as consciousness without feelings, actually. We're always, our brain evolved to regulate our physiology and to move. The 
complex things of imagination and logic and the higher functions of consciousness are all rooted in and dependent on feeling safe. If you don't feel safe, you get hijacked by your threat detection processes. So consciousness is a beautiful bit of noise on top of the process of feeling and regulating. I like this, I don't like this, I'm aroused and I'm calm. That is the subset that everything else depends on. And if that is full of agitation and full of danger messages, then everything else doesn't work very well at all. Yeah, some shorthand things. So I didn't really get into what to do when we are anxious. Let me try. Um, so SP, what about waking up feeling anxious and heart racing? Well, I do offer a lot of small things add up to big things. So over time, a complex condition like an emotional state of anxiety, an emotional, well, uh, yeah, I want to be careful. There. A complex experience of anxiety in response to our physiology, there are no simple answers here, unfortunately. Lots of things can work, but lots of small things tend to add up. So sleeping, eating, being around people who value you, learning to practice your breathing, learning to regulate your body, these things take time and skill and practice. But doing things that motivate you, that feel challenging maybe, but feel engaging for you, um, anything that helps you feel safe, anything that helps you act, anything that helps you move and feel agency and choice will begin to take the edge off the danger messages and will start supporting you to feel le le less anxious. So see it as a long-term project. And over time, waking up, feeling out of control, having repetitive thoughts, the more you can regulate, the more you find those little windows of feeling a little bit of safety, moving a little bit more, eating a little bit more, um, uh, the more I would hope that you come out of those really hyperactive states. Uh, feeling emotions and chemical states, yeah, I mean, all feeling is, a, is a, a response to the fluid chemical milieu inside of us. Basically, even neural activity is chemical packages being transmitted along nerves or between nerves. So neurotransmitters are in the same territory as hormones or in the same territory of immune transmitters. So we are a sea of chemicals. And cells learn to soak those chemicals up or secrete those chemicals. This is being sensitive. Being sensitive is your ability to secrete, absorb chemicals with your cells. So anxiety is always a fluid chemical experience, always experiences, knowledges, experiences. That's just how it is. We know that things that used to be called classic hormones were only thought to circulate in the blood actually go into the brain. And we know that immune cells secrete chemicals that end up causing inflammation and changing our mood and state of our brain. Really good book on mental health and bodies is called The Inflamed Mind, showing that inflammatory states lead us to being depressed. We also have great research that the microbiome, that our gut bacteria, secrete chemicals that change us to be more anxious and more happy. Some incredible research on mice. You take the poo from a happy mouse and put it in an anxious mouse and the anxious mouse becomes less anxious. So absolutely um, our experience of feeling, sensing, knowing is rooted in a biological reality of fluid chemical states. And the fluids don't just aren't, and the chemicals aren't just neurotransmitters, they're hormones, they're immune cells, and they're the products of uh, secretions from bacteria. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit. So I'm a body worker. Uh, I use many tools to help people uh, feel their body. I like movement. I like understanding that I try and sell the idea that uh, physiology is as important as psychology. And I'm actually offering that physiology drives psychology. So how do we change our physiology? So I use touch as a way of doing that. 
So I get people to move and shake. I do something called TRE, trauma releasing exercises. The idea we get tight and contracted and shaking can help release our body or wake up our body. But my primary way of working, the thing that I've been doing the longest for over 20 years now is called cranial sacral therapy. So this is a very, very gentle way of touching, not a way of forcing people to feel differently, not sort of uh, wiggling bones and poking and prodding. It's kind of think of cranial sacral therapy as meditative awareness. So a skilled touch can help people connect to states of joy and ease in safe, negotiated touch that isn't about trying to change you, but trying to connect to you and connect to your fundamental humanity, connect to states of joy and ease, connect to flows and movements in you, to reflect back to the, your diaphragm is tight or your neck muscles are tight. And just notice in that tightness, is it possible to breathe differently or soften? So often having someone who's skillful touch you safely kind of generates a response of noticing, gosh, I'm holding my shoulders tight, or gosh, I'm holding my diaphragm tight, or gosh, I can't feel my belly. And together with someone who provides safety, who helps regulate what you're feeling, we can use touch as a way to reboot, our, reboot the physiology, to help you be more skillful at the feeling business, to help you come out of stuck, fixed, simple states that you're, I'm always calling myself anxious, I'm always calling myself tense. Maybe there's all sorts of other things going on. So because feeling is so hard, people need help to feel. There's all sorts of ways of doing that from yoga to breath work, to cold showers, to uh, doing slow movement. I use shaking as a way of helping people feel differently. And I use cranial sacral therapy safe non-doing touch touch that is really focused on slow pulsatile movements in the body our bodies are massive tunes and rhythms we have a heartbeat we have lung breathing we have muscles twitching we have circadian rhythms we have a guts that are contracting and waves of activity going on all the time we are rhythms upon rhythms upon rhythms one of the big skills of a cranial sacral therapist is to listen to the rhythms, to feel how are your rhythms working together? Is there a beautiful, elegant tune being played in you that's the coherent music? Doesn't matter what type of music, you could be playing rock and roll, you could be playing punk music, you could be playing Vivaldi. It's whether the music is coherent or not, whether things are talking and communicating, whether the rhythms of your endocrine secretions are in tune with the rhythms of your uh, immune system or in tune with the rhythms and circulatory qualities in your gut or are in tune with your nervous system. Are these systems communicating or is this contraction, fragmentation, is one part of your body speeding up, one part of your body collapsed, and there isn't a sense of coherence and rhythm and moving uh, together inside of you. So often we've got tight jaws and things are different above and below our jaw, or our neck is different from our jaw, or our chest is high, and our chest is really tight and our belly is really soft. They're not communicating. There isn't an even flow and balance. I've learned that skillful meditative touch that we do in craniosacral therapy can really help promote new communication within the body and help prevent new rhythms emerge. We can play more beautiful, more coherent tunes with the gift of skillful meditative awareness uh, in the touch of craniosacral therapy. I really like it because it's non-prescriptive. It's an act of listening to you and helping you feel. It's almost like we're holding up a perfect mirror. Still safe hands help you find a sense of joy, connection and new possibilities in your body. So I can teach you to do beautiful non-doing touch of biodynamic cranial sacral therapy. We teach two year programs to do that. Uh, my teaching is through Body College. 
and we have a course in Galway, Ireland. I'm in Galway teaching on seminar four right now, actually, of the current course. And I teach in London. Uh, we have a course in London running right now and a new one starting in September. So if you are interested in learning more about touch and also interested in biodynamic cranial sacral therapy as a way of helping people come out of anxiety by being more connected to their body, by being able to regulate their physiology, by being able to find that gap between stimulus and, oh, I could do something different by helping people find that gap. Touch is a very powerful way to help people not be stuck in classic mental health problems of anxiety and anger and depression. Good. So yes, bodycollege.net, have a look if you're interested. There's also there's uh, um, all sorts of resources about pain, anxiety, and trauma. This video will be posted up there. Uh, but primarily there's courses on cranial psychotherapy, one in Galway, one in Ireland, uh, one in London starting in September. Cool. I'm gonna have a look at some of the um, comments, see if I've picked up anything or missing anything really important to people. So just sort of chatting a little bit, really. Ah, good, yeah, so I, I, I wonder using your model, how successfully someone else could, in be could be in trying to interpret your feelings since they can't sense your physiology. Ooh, yes, that's a really interesting question. I think we're always sensing other people's physiology, actually. When we came into the world, other human beings were really, really important. We didn't learn through words. We learned through being stroked, touched, seeing, smelling, and copying other people. Our mum was soft and warm and open. Our caregivers, any caregiver, were soft and warm and open and nurturing their touch, their sounds, their gestures. Not the content of the words, but the sounds they made would all soothe us and give us a sense that safety was a particular set of sounds and feelings and qualities. So actually, I think we're always sensing other people. We mirror and empathize. We do that through reproducing what we see around us. A dancer is elegant and beautiful, and we reproduce that, we're inspired by that because our body tries to reproduce what we see inside of us. If we're around calm people, we calm down. So absolutely we mirror. In therapeutic body work, we really teach you how to discern and how to be skillful at sensing other people by realizing that your body is a tuning fork or a antennae that picks up on what happens in someone else. So we can do that just by watching, smelling, noticing other people, but we can far more easily uh, differentiate using touch. Touch is an incredibly powerful way of tuning in to the speed, the heart rate, the heartbeat, the muscle tension of someone else and beginning to get a sense of what's happening in their physiology. So you might realize someone is really, really tight. You might feel some of the tensions and in the conversation and experience and dynamic that emerges between you, you can come to a shared truth. And someone might say, my tension is always anxiety. And you say, well, it could be something else. And let's look at all the feelings that are happening. And are you sure this is anxiety? Maybe we can lean into and feel that bit of speed. I'm safe. I'm with you. <sighs> oh, and maybe it's not as bad as it could be. Maybe you can realize that you're in a safe space with me right now. Maybe you could do something different from what you've always done when you feel that racing heart or churning gut. So, yes, Gosh, we can be incredibly skillful at interpreting feelings and touch really, really helps us do that. And I'd say that's any therapist uh, uses somatic mirroring to help them understand what's going on. This is a normal feature and you can get much more skillful at it. And it's particularly skillfully taught and a particularly important part of how we diagnose and understand. Empathy is an embodiment process. 
I reproduce what I perceive in front of me to understand the other person and to know the other person. Is anxiety in the genes to a degree? Yes, there's some, there is some evidence of most mental health problems have multiple causes. And there is some evidence of uh, anxiety traits, but it's weak evidence. It's not, um, it's not definitive. So it's a possibility within you that might be more easily triggered than some other people, but it's not the dominant cause of anxiety as I understand it. We don't really know why some people are more anxious than other, other than prior learning or in uterine events, or, or, or we don't know. Uh, trauma is a big, uh, I would offer uh, adverse childhood experiences is an early predictor of, of, of people being stuck in mental health problems such as anxiety. Uh, but other than that, uh, yes, a little bit of genetic, but it's not a big effect as I understand it. Nice, so Jan, you had an experience of scar tissue and pain, I'm assuming, and a whole package of things on your elbow. So you had a serious elbow break and there was a traumatic overlaser on that. Let's say some anxiety or speed or fear or pain and uh, a light touch of scar therapy helped you regulate, helped new possibilities in the tissues. And as the tissues change and your physiology changed, the classic mental health issue of trauma and maybe some anxiety changed by helping the tissues soften. Fantastic. Physiology leads psychology. So I know I said Ida Rolf, there's no such thing as psychology. There's only physiology. Uh, and then the classic, there's only mental health, anxiety is only um, only psychology. I'm in the middle, a little bit more towards the scale of Ida Rolf. I don't think it's only uh, physiology. I think physiology is far more important that we realize and regulating physiology is incredibly important. But we are complex meaning makings machines. And we use the stories that we've always used to make sense of what happens inside of us. Remember that snake, there's a morass of information that doesn't make sense. We learn something about it and now we can predict what that mess of information is, but we get stuck and habitual in our predicting. However, we can construct new stories. We can describe ourselves in new ways with practice. We can find 50 ways of being crappy and 50 ways of being awesome. Now we have a hundred emotions instead of just two and that gives choice and flexibility. So I think those are psychological gestures. They're learning and interpretations and perceptions. We're using new words, new ways of describing, new stories to regulate our physiology. There's this mutual interaction between story and physiology. Our story can fix our physiology, but our story can help us reconstruct our physiology and interpret it in new ways. My heart's racing. I've always called that anxiety, but if I learn, I can might call that Monday morning anticipation of a difficult day at work feeling. That's a mouthful, but you collect those and you'll, you'll find shorthands and you'll begin to have 50 different ways of crappiness, 50 different forms of anxiety, but initially they'll start off as quite clunky. Monday morning, don't want to go to work. Anxiety is different from Friday. I need a couple, I've got only got an hour to finish off what I need to do, anxiety. Gosh, yeah, so Vicky, any suggestions on how to support young adults and children with this ever-increasing issue of anxiety? Well, first off, don't tell them that they're anxious um, or don't tell them that they're fixed and innately anxious. That's just horrible to do to people. Uh, but say that we can learn. So um, movement, engagement, being in nature, more community time, more interaction um, and helping people reframe. So teaching children that um, uh, to explore feeling states, you know, the classic one of, of uh, helping us understand that uh, physiology is important is you give kid lots of sugar, then they're going to run around and be very quick. And some of them will be anxious and super excited. But the speed is triggered by the chemical sugar in this case. So it's really interesting to know that 
physiological states help us move differently. So that's a nice example to say that um, uh, going quick, sometimes caused by chemicals, but going quick makes you think more quickly and makes you make bad decisions. So let's see if we can learn to be slow. Let's see if we can learn to interpret that. Let's be careful of things that make us go too quick. So the ability to pause and breathe and reflect, those are great things to teach children. Don't give the do the disservice of telling them that they're fixed and uh, they're always going to be like this. You're an angry, anxious child. That doesn't really help people. Teach them flexibility and a whole range of different forms of excitement. And really this construct that anxiety is a protective feeling rooted in the perception of danger. So anything we can do to help children feel safe is going to be important here. Safe to feel, safe to relate, safe to move, safe to engage with nature. Um, uh, a course of treatments can work. Sometimes we need, uh, you can do incredible work in one, two, three sessions, learn some basic skills. A lot of what I do is teaching people they need to learn how to regulate their body. It's like learning to drive a car. So we can teach them essential, simple skills in a few sessions. Three to six is often a great number. That's a little bit like learning to drive a car. I hope you can go and drive and do most of the driving yourself, but I don't know whether your healing journey is driving to Paris or Timbuktu or down to Johannesburg. So once you've learned to drive, you can do most of the work yourself, but often you might need a guide or a little bit of a check-in for some resourcing and polishing of skills or just topping up. And sometimes you might need someone to go along with you for long parts of the journey. So very much teaching skills. That's really important to me. All therapeutic work is about empowering people to act and move and to learn how to regulate for themselves. Um, I think you can learn a lot of that in three to six sessions, a lot in six to 12 sessions. That's two, three months of work quite often for many people. And a lot of my clients will do some intense periods, three to six, six to 12 sessions, and they'll go away. And then they might come back, um, you know, a couple of times a year for periods of sessions. It tends to be my preferred way of working. Um, but yeah, so it's how long is a piece of string with treatments? But don't be, if you learn skills and some of these heightened sensitivities, we can really turn them off quite quickly. Being stuck in primitive reflexes, is um, is a little bit like just the thermostats turned up too high on the heating system. If we can turn down the thermostat, if we can flip the switch back to safety and joy and ease and comfort, then all the systems that are affected by the thermostat um, can all work differently. But the key is the switch. And the key to the anxiety is feeling safety. And the key to that is embodied safety, being able to regulate intense physiological sensations. Yeah, I'm so sorry, George, George, Georgina. I'm trying not to, trying to not feel anxious about feeling anxious. And yes, it can be contagious being around other anxiety people. I read the best present you can give someone is a regulated nervous system. Yeah, hang around with safe people. Uh, but, you know, finding the safest person in the room, find allies and guides, find people you trust. Start from a safe space, expose yourself to a little bit more uh, that's out of your comfort zone, but know you can always leave. Know that you can, you know, uh, sit, uh, go to a corner, find a quiet place. It can really help us um, in those negotiations with people. Good. Okay, folks, well, I'm going to sign off. That was an hour and a half. Uh, hopefully some useful things about anxiety and a little bit about using touch. Um, mostly the big take home moment thing is keep feeling, keep feeling, keep feeling. Feelings aren't beacons of eternal truth. Feelings are negotiable. We are sold and told that feelings are fixed. They're innate. That's not what I'm teaching. The only things that are innate are speeding up, seeking, and avoiding, contracting, collapsing. We build all sorts of stories and attempts to make sense of how we're speeding up, which systems are speeding up, which ingredients, and we can make all sorts of beautiful, complex stories out of that. But it's negotiable. Even the most constant worry, anxiety is negotiable. It takes practice. 
Sometimes we need strong allies and support, but let your body be part of that. Learn to breathe, learn to move, learn to tolerate intense sensations, to move towards, move away, and just practice the feeling business. It's an extraordinary tool, making friends with your body and feeling at home in your body. The payoff of embodiment and finding safety to learning to regulate your physiology is enormous. Less anxiety, less depression, less inflammation, uh, more ability to move and sleep and eat. All of those things will follow as we learn to regulate our physiology. Thanks for paying attention, folks. I'll pop you an email with a um, link to the recording. Uh, gluttons for punishment, if you might want to watch it again, possibly, who knows. Um, good luck, folks, and maybe see you in a cranial course or in a cranial treatment at some stage.